Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Songwriters on Process podcast. My name is Benno Papari, and since 2010, I've run the Songwriters on Process website, where you can find more than 200 conversations with songwriters about the creative process. I'm not here to talk about tour stories, band drama, how a band got its name, or favorite foods. My goal is to treat songwriters as writers, plain and simple. This is an intelligent conversation about the writing process between two writers. And today's interview is with Britt Daniel of Spoon. So can I just say that this is one of my favorite album titles of all time, the new Spoon album, Lucifer on the Sofa. As I told Britt, I loved how euphonic it is. It sounds good. Cipher Sofa, Lucifer on the Sofa. You can say it forever. It's such a great sounding title. And the album, one of my favorites of the year. I love the guitar. It's such a Oh, I love this album. The first time I heard it, um, I listened to it over and over again because it was just, it's, I love that sound. So that aside, this was a revealing conversation about Daniel's uh, creative process. Um, and as he, he told me that linear doesn't work for him when it comes to the process. He starts to judge when he writes in linear fashion. And he says that uh, he likes to write without any direction. And um, one of the, I think the, the quote, the best summarizes that when he, when he uh, told me, when I try to write with intention, I come up empty. And if I'm not trying to do anything, I've been more successful. Trying to be organized can be a dead end. So in other words, I don't think he very often sits down and says, I'm going to write. He just starts to write without any any direction. And that's when the best ideas come. I've heard that a lot, too, from songwriters. Um, And I asked him um, about distance, the idea of giving yourself distance after you write and coming back to something later on. And he said to me, distance is my way of having a writing partner. And that kind of blew my mind. So he doesn't co-write. But his co-writer, if he has one, is himself. So he writes something, and when he comes back to it later, it's like a new person looking at it. And that's, if you're a writer, right, the best revision process is distance. Uh, Spending time away from something gives you new perspective on that. So, uh, oh, and one more thing. If you ever see Britt Daniel in a crowded restaurant with a notebook or a computer, beware he's probably paying attention to what you are saying Um, he told me he loves to go to crowded restaurants and bars with a computer or a notebook he says i may not look happy but i'm i love being around people it's an energy source for me and when he goes to crowded places that's where he gets a lot of song ideas so with that here's my interview with brit daniel of spoon all right cool let's get started so rather than make this kind of like a pandemic related question you know my last interview was with ben bridwell from band of horses and he talked about how difficult it is to write under great emotional weight so i don't want to make this like hey what was it like to write in the pandemic kind of question but in general you know independent of the past two years is it difficult to write under great emotional weight whatever that is or do you find that that can be a source of like immediate strength in the creative process Um, normally I would say that it feels good to write. Um, it, it, I mean, it, it, (laughs) it's good to write when you feel good, you you can be more productive, but I, I found the time of lockdown to be a pretty productive time for me. And I think it's because I figured out that writing at that moment was the thing that made me feel the most normal. And once I kind of, you know, figured that out one afternoon, then I, got a bit addicted to it. I wanted to kind of stay in that world, you know, helped me kind of feel like things were normal for a second. The people who say that they have been productive, actually, that's exactly what they say is almost related that is a sense of, um, yeah, like a sense of comfort, like anything normal to get out of that. But, you know, gosh, I've interviewed so many people who have said things like they wrote for the first month, they wrote a lot like Patterson Hood from the drive by truckers told me he wrote a lot for the, for the first month. And then there's nothing then to write about. Yeah, yeah. Because either emotionally or because there was nothing to write about because you're not around people. Right. Um, and those experiences. So do you find that that, that that's difficult if you're, 
you know, if you're not around people and not around hearing things and seeing things, is that a hard, is that a difficult place to write from? Um, <clears throat> I don't think it's necessary to have, I mean, I do feed off of people's energy and lots of times what I'll do is go to a, when I'm writing lyrics, sometimes I'll go to somewhere where there are a lot of people, but I'm by myself and just sort of take in that energy. It helps me write. But I got lucky, you know, I mean, um, I have friends who said they just did not want to write during the pandemic. You know, people who, my friend Brad Cox. I don't know if I'm speaking out of school or not, but he told me that, uh, and this is a guy that's so prolific and yeah. writes so fast. Um, he just said, I just don't want to do it. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not the time to do it. But for me, it it came easy. And I, I'm trying to think of some of the songs I wrote during the, the peak or the whatever, the depths of lockdown. Um, one of them, uh, The Devil and Mr. Jones, I kind of already had the lyrics on a piece of paper and then someone sent me some music and then I just kind of combined them. One of the songs was sort of about the moment of the pandemic. Um, and then I just got lucky with some other ones, I guess, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, Hemingway once said, I always feel like I have to invoke Hemingway, but Hemingway once said he could never write about Paris when he was in Paris. He could never, <laughs> he always needed distance from the place or the emotions. Right. So I guess that's what I'm also getting at is do you need distance to be able to write about something uh, or, or are you more effective in the moment when it can be an emotion or an event or something like that? Yeah, maybe I, you know, I hadn't thought about that. Um, I guess the distance helps. And I, and I kind of thinking back to what I first told you that sometimes when it, when I do feel the most, um, distressed or, you know, you go through some kind of early emotional or tricky era moment that for the most part has not been the best time for me to write, hmm. you know, when you're really going through it because I feel too, you know, wrecked by the moment uh, yeah. it helps me to have some more energy and kind of confidence. And so, yeah, maybe that now that I'm piecing it together, maybe that is about the distance from, uh, the distance from the actual event. Yeah. That tends to be, again, like it, it, people say it's, you know, the immediacy of it helps people process, but then the distance helps them see it from a new kind of, I guess, you know, it's just a different perspective. Yeah. Um, I get yeah. Um, so deadlines also, uh, you, you know, again, like there, I, there was an article in the Washington post it was about a year ago. The theater critic said, this will be a great time for artists because Shakespeare wrote King Lear during the plague. And, and, you know, and you've got all this time to write because, Hey, you're not touring. So I guess the question there is, do you write well under deadlines, you know, if I, or do you write well? Cause people say, Hey, I've got a year to write, you know, uh, and, and, that kind of paralyzes them or if so, or do you write well under pressure or do you need, do you write well under great expanses of time? Probably the great expanses of time for me. Really? Yeah. I think so. Because when I, when I think back on the times that I've, um, uh, when I, I've done this trick several times where I'm working on a record and or trying to write this, I'm in the writing phase for a record and um, it helps me to go away uh, and get somewhere where I can do just nothing else um, and just have blank time to myself. Um, and that's where I can be way more productive. So that makes me think that it's not a deadline thing. It's um, just feeling like I have the time to, to do everything as it comes. You know what I mean? Yeah. Do you let's talk about that ritual then? I'm fascinated by the the ritual of the 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 artist in general, whether it's time of day, favorite room. Like for me, like I write in this chair, but I revise in that chair behind me. Right. Um, you know, it's just it it's where I don't know why, it, whether it's a superstition, but I feel like if it's happened there before, you know, at least there's a good shot of that happening. For me, it's distance. Like I can never write and revise in the same place because I need to do, I need to be in a different spot to be able to, to be in that different part of the process. But so that's my ritual. Um, I'm much more of a morning person. Yeah. Um, but, but how important is a ritual to your process? 
Um, I mean, I think there are lots of rituals. Uh, sometimes when you talk about where you sit, um, it made me think of um, that sometimes when uh, it's really time and you're at the, and you know it's time you get, you've put it off long enough. For me, it helps to just sit on the floor and hmm. put all the lyrics out on the, on the ground. Something about that, I don't know what it is. Um, it feels like we're, we're gonna get this done until, until I get up off this floor, <laughs> you know, like I'm not getting up until this is done. Um, something about sitting on the floor. I love that. I've never heard that before. Uh, the, the, so the floor is for the sense of urgency, like, okay, we've got to get this. It's like, it's almost like I'm going back to, a um, uh, embryonic state or something, you know, a very, uh, basic, um, early man kind of thing. I don't know. It's just, right. (laughs) I love it. Getting down on the floor and that if this is it. You know, yeah. You basics. You're not even sitting in a chair. You got to, you got to just get it done down here while you're down here. Maybe it's that you're so uncomfortable down there. You <laughs> feel like that's your reward, right? You can't get up until everything's finished. Maybe it's because when I first started writing songs, I would be on the floor. I didn't have any chairs in my room, you know, uh, I'm trying to think, you know, like when I really first started writing, um, it was when I really first started writing songs, it would be when I came to school after high school and you know i had a bed you know it was just a mattress on the floor you know and i had a a boom box and i had um you know some milk crates that i used for uh for storing things you know but there was no no furniture (laughs) and i would just get my four track put it on the floor i'm sitting on the floor with my guitar i'm sitting cross-legged Maybe that's where it goes back to. I don't know. That's fascinating because clearly you can afford a chair now, but right. yet you are, it's that, but again, like for me, it's the confidence. I mean, or maybe it's because it's just, it's the most comfortable spot to be in. Um, but it's, it's, that's so interesting that it's independent of where you are. Like, I wonder if I put you in another room, if you'd still sit on the floor, regardless of what the room is. Right. Yeah. Um, is there a, now you mentioned, uh, lyrics, are you a pen and paper person or a computer person? Um, if I'm, it's more fun to do it on pen and, and pen and paper. And I, uh, sometimes I even trans, I'll, I'll have a lot of lyrics on computer and I sort of translate them to paper and edit down, edit out the ones I don't like, put the good ones on paper. Um, something about that, that feels, um, more creative, and just the way that you write the letters can affect how you feel about those words. You know what I mean? If, yeah. they're, all, if they're all in this single font, um, it, it's a little less character to them, right? How do you do it? Uh, well, I would love to. It, it, I would love to tell you. Um, I, you know, you and I are roughly around the same age, and so yeah, I'd love to be able to tell you that I use pen and paper, but my handwriting is so bad uh-huh. because I use a computer so often. Um, I'm a, I'm a computer person, right? Um, but I could do an entire website dedicated just to the types of pens and colors of ink that songwriters use. Right. Right. And that, and, and I mean, so does that matter to you? It seems like all songwriters have their favorite type of pen or even color and type of paper. I mean, don't get me wrong. I still write a lot of lyrics on the computer, but, right. but if I have the choice and if I'm really like going about the process of, Hey, let's go write some poetry or let's go write some future lyrics. Then, um, yeah, I might do it right and get a really nice, uh, moleskin notebook. And, uh, the pen doesn't really matter as much to me. I'll just grab no. available, but, um, but, uh, if I'm just even taking the step to be writing it with by hand, then, um, that's a, that's a big step. Do I- you, or are you a linear songwriter? I asked that because I interviewed Daniel Lanois. This was about six months ago. And I think you told me all of his lyrics are on an 11 by 22 uh, piece of blank art paper. And there's thought bubbles and arrows and words all over the place. There's no linear form at all to the lyrics. So are you a linear songwriter or those things tend to be all over the place on that page? 
Um, I think that uh, when I try to write with intention, sometimes I can come up empty, you know? And if I try to, and if I'm not trying to do anything and I'm just letting it come, or I'm just going by sort of an, an instinct or a, I don't really know why I'm writing this, but it feels good kind of thing. Um, I feel like I've been more successful. Um, so I guess that means I'm nonlinear, right? Yeah. Now both, both can work, but it's something about trying to be organized and trying uh, to set off down a road. Sometimes uh, it can be a dead end. Is there a time of day when you tend to do your best writing or does that mat not matter? Um, I think I'm a, I'm a, uh, <laughs> I think I'm an afternoon to early evening kind of guy when it comes to the, to the lyrics, um, music could, could happen at any time. Yeah. You know? Do you have to have anything with you? you know, can be a drink, can be anything that just, so again, like I, to me, it's all confidence, right? It's just, there are certain things as a ritual I need to have with me right. in order to feel like there might be a greater chance of success. <laughs> it's almost uh, superstitious, right? Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, do anything like that or no? Um. Yeah, I think that usually caffeine is involved. Yeah, well, of course. Yeah. Um, I've tried it under different uh, chemicals, and caffeine is <laughs> the one with the, be the best success rate. <laughs> That's true. Uh, when it comes to revising your lyrics, are there, like, I, I, I was trying to think about when my, what I do in my revision process. My revision process involves a lot of, I kind of get, when I write, I get everything out of the page and then I organize later. Um, not so much taking out words. It's more just getting, I'm, I get everything out there. There's a great essay by the novelist Anne Lamott. And she wrote this, uh, it's in one of her books, but the essay is called Shitty First Drafts. And she talks about how the first draft of anything needs to be atrocious without a care of perfection or yeah. correctness. Yeah. So what is that, what is that revision process like for you? And how would, do you subscribe to that theory? I guess. I was just about to say that I, I totally subscribe to that. Um, you don't need to be judging yourself as you're, and maybe that's why the uh, linear sometimes doesn't work for me because I am judging. Am I going down this path that I'm intending to go down or what am I trying to get out? It helps for me to not have any specific direction uh, and then to come back and think, okay, now what could that become? You know, um, I wrote this beautiful bit here that uh, I may not have known exactly what it was about. And now that I'm coming back to it with a different frame of mind, I can see that, oh yeah, this could become this. Um, you know what I mean? Does that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Do you, then I guess, do you find that distance is a big, like I know for me walking away, distance always gives me new perspective. So maybe when you're in a, even when, when you're in a rut or when you're not in a rut, do you find that when you come back to something, it just opens up things that you didn't see the last time? For sure. And I, and I've even thought that, Working with distance, it's like if you're by yourself, that's your way of, of having a partner, you know? Hmm. Oh, I way, like that. Uh, your way of having um, a different, uh, you know, because when you have two different people who are, who are working on something, and I always think about Lennon and McCartney, Joe Strummer and Mick Jones, the two of them by themselves could write amazing stuff, but you put them together and the... Um, the combination uh, feeds on itself. It makes it exponentially better what's going on, whether that's the music or, or the lyrics or whatever. Um, and so, uh, so at times I do feel like I'm, uh, <laughs> that's how I, that's how I get my partner. You're your own partner. Yeah. Interesting. Um, what about the role of movement? I am fascinated by this, the role of movement to the process. So I'll break this down. There's a few things. There's the walking, the biking, the hiking, the running, the driving. There's that. 
And then there's also, and I've talked to, maybe it's because we've been stuck in the house for two years. So many songwriters tell me they get song ideas during mundane activities, vacuuming, uh, cleaning, gardening, Shower. something. Yeah. So I hear showering all the role of water. Um, cause I've heard swimming a lot too, yeah. but something about the mundane activities that lets you kind of shut off that part of your brain. So how often does that, how much is that any of those types of movement, do they play in your, your writing process? Yeah, for sure. It gets you in a different, uh, frame of mind where again, you're not judging and you, it becomes more of a, um, you lose track of your intention. Um, mm -hmm. but the, and I had success with a few of those that you mentioned, but I think the one that, that really stands out for me is driving. And I feel like I wrote maybe a quarter of the lyrics to girls can tell whilst driving, um, you know, really long, really, really long, uh, drives alone. And at that time I would be kind of, writing with run one hand while I'm steering with the left, you know, and not really looking <laughs> right <laughs> Go back later. And it's kind of hard to read some of those things. Now I've got a little handheld or you can just always use your phone now, but, but back then it was just kind of scribbling ideas. And I, you know, lines in the suit was practically written, uh, as I'm driving. <laughs> really? Yeah. And is it just about the monotony or do you, or are there things that you see? I mean, billboards or, things like that. What is it about the driving? I'm fascinated by it. You know, just that, that why, how movement lets us like you would think intuitively that driving or anything, you know, anything that even involves a small amount of attention would distract from creativity. I mean, intuitively that would make sense, but right. what is it about those things that gets us, that gives us so many ideas? I don't know. Um, I think it's just a way, the place that your mind goes when you're um, focusing on other things. Um, when you're focused on this one chore that you can actually do without really thinking, you know, mm -hmm. driving or walking, there's, you're on autopilot, right? And when you're yeah. on that autopilot, um, your brain goes to cool places. So yeah. for me, it would be, it would, it could be something that I passed along the road. It could be, uh, something I heard on the radio, a lot of, a lot of times, something I heard on the radio, either a misheard lyric or a starting point for a lyric from another song or, um, you know, thinking about, as you do, you think about your life. Uh, these things come up when you're, and I've heard, I've heard songwriters even tell me when they're walking or hiking or biking, something about the cadence mm -hmm. actually, uh, you know, the cadence of the walk or the sounds of the bike, yeah. It produces some kind of, of melody, a riff or something like that. Has that ever yeah. happened? Uh, I don't know that it's happened to me, but I feel like I've heard people say that. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's gotta be for real. I've heard things like the, the sound of the thumping going over covered bridges in upstate New York. I've heard uh, turn signals. You'd be, uh, I've heard car alarms. Right. Uh, um, so many of those things people go, it's, you know, it's a beat. And that goes, oh, like, you know, right. see where that takes me. Um, how about those? And how about the, the monotonous activities inside? Or you said showering even, but is that kind of the same thing that your brain is on autopilot with those things too? Does that ever happen? Like, can you, are there any, you know, you think, oh, I, this song came to me when I was doing this. Um, I know that, uh, I feel like metal detector came to me as I was cleaning the house. I'm not sure if that mm -hmm. was rhythmic or what, but that was one of those few songs where, um, I wrote it without, um, without an instrument. And that's, that's pretty cool. I think that's what you're talking about when people yep. just, they hear something of the, you know, that becomes the instrument. Yeah. Um, and it's in, it's in, seems like when that happens, the song almost pops out fully formed. Uh, but when you were saying that, the thing that it made me think about was, I don't know if you ever heard Barry Gibb tell the story about how he wrote Jive Talking and it was about, yep. yeah, what you know what I mean? Driving in the car across the, the highway. Yep. Yeah, I have heard that. That's a great oh, cool. story. Yeah. Um, 
you so you mentioned conversations listening for conversations do you when when you're in those spaces where you hear people talking is it a conscious listening for a line or is it just kind of like subconsciously let the words wash over you and maybe something because i think there's a difference right there's a difference yep. between actively listening and saying let me soak it all in and see if just something floats in there um well i, I do like to be you know uh to me it's just, it's it's often about the just like a, a, people's conversations and being around people can be an energy source so mm. you know i might uh, I like to go to alone to a crowded restaurant or even a, a crowded bar. And personally, I, I love that experience. And sometimes people think that's sad, you know, for, <laughs> um, I had several friends who were like, no, you don't want to do that. I'll come join you up there. I'm like, no, you don't need to. This is, this is good for me. And I really, you know, I go to my favorite restaurant and I sit there with an, uh, either a computer or a, um, a notebook and, I don't know what it may not look like I'm happy or uh, <laughs> that like this is the, my preferred choice because everybody else in the restaurant is talking to friends, and, but I like it, you know, it's a, and just feeling being around people is an energy source for me. And so uh, that's one of my favorite ways to do it. So, so the next time I see you in a bar by yourself, people got to be careful because you're probably typing out the things you're, 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 you're noting the things that you're hearing, right? You're not working on yeah. something else. You're saying, it, um, could be, it could be either way. It could be, I'm just get you know, it could be just all coming to me from my mind. And it's just the energy of being around people. I could do for sure. I hear people say things or shout things in bars that might be a good starting point. Yeah. It's all, it's all, it's all a possibility. And that also reminds me, I mean, I, I write, I need total silence when I write. I can't have the television, Really, I, but yeah, nothing. It's so anything I hear, I mean, I can't, I could never write in a coffee shop if I'm on an airplane and people around me are talking, I, I can't tune that out. Mm -hmm. But a lot of songwriters tell me, I think like you're saying, they thrive on that energy, that they yeah. love that you know, that they, the, the hustle and bustle, or maybe it's the difference between writing in like, you know, upstate New York or, you know, or New York or Manhattan or something, right? That it's the sound versus the silence, but it sounds like you feed off that. Like you actually love whether you're consciously listening to it. You just like that energy when you write. For sure. Yeah. That really works for me. Yeah. Yeah. I can do it alone too, but it's just a different, uh, different vibe. You know? Um, some songwriters tell me that I one songwriter in particular tell me that if any songwriter, if any songwriter tells me that they go back and listen to all those voice memos, they're lying. He said, I have all those voice memos. I never listened to them. And everyone else has said that person's crazy. So you must have just so many voice memos on that phone. Do you really go back through them? Yeah. You do. Yeah. You, I do. And I either delete them or I catalog them. I either delete them or I write them down in a notebook or I put them on a computer. The do two, you have a, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's too valuable to just let it, it <laughs> that's where the, so many good songs have come from that. So I, I don't want to just, I don't know, maybe that guy was, uh, I don't know how many voice notes he was leaving for himself, but um, for me, it, it, it it's a good thing. Now, do you go back there when you're, do you go back and say, oh, this song needs, this part let me go back and 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 through those voice are you looking for those through those voice memos when you may need something in a song that's not there yet maybe i'm maybe i'm more organized than most but if i if i uh, record some voice notes i'm i'm usually going to get it transcribed you know that day or the next day okay yeah it doesn't just sit there do you, do you have an organizing and I, I listen on the other hand some songwriters tell me they have they organize down to the Excel spreadsheet that they have these things. So do you have a filing system for those? No, I just put them in a, I put them in a, a general lyrics, either file or in a, a notebook. And it is true that sometimes, especially like when I was starting out this, this last album and writing for it, I knew I had so much stuff in there and that, you know, oftentimes when it's time, when you need those lyrics is kind of uh, when you're in the in the process, maybe I'll have a melody that I've started singing with guitar and I want 
something to, you know, see, if, will this fit into what I, can I make something fit into here? But if I've got a, a full, um, whatever, uh, six months worth of lyrics, <laughs> Uh, there might be some garbage in there. There's a very good chance there'll be some garbage in there. So, so at times I'll go through and weed out, you know, just my, here's my favorite stuff and I'll put that all in one place. And then that's, that's kind of a cool thing to have when, uh, it, when you, when you need it and you don't want to go searching for it, you want to know that your best stuff is right here. But that goes back to what we talked about earlier. I think you've got to write the garbage. Don't show you got to write yeah, the garbage. Do. For sure. You got to write that garbage, but then you go back later and you figure out which ones are, uh, worth holding on to. Yeah. Do you do any types of writing outside of songwriting? Some songwriters tell me they dabble in, you know, I don't know, short stories, journaling, poetry, anything like that. Journaling for sure. Yeah. Really? Okay. Um, is that a, is that a, is that a something you do? Is that a routine, like a daily thing? No, it's not. Uh, yeah. It's not planned out. It just, uh, it just happens. Often it happens at night for me. Hmm. Do you mine those journals for song ideas? Yeah. Yeah. So again, it'll be, um, yeah, I always, uh, whatever I'm writing, I'm eventually going to come back to it and, and, and figure out, um, is that worth keeping or not? I do read it all, you know? Yeah. It's not a thing where I'm just journaling and then I'm going to go look back when I'm 64 or whatever. Right. <laughs> right. Um, that reminds me, I just read this fascinating study uh, uh, in Smithsonian Magazine and they referenced um, the period right before we doze off as being a part of intense creativity. Oh, not, yeah. not while you're sleeping, but and then me moments. So that so what they did was they um they told a story about Salvador Dali and what he would do is he would sit in this incredibly uncomfortable chair with a skeleton key in his hand and a dish on the floor. And so when he would about to when he would doze off, he'd let go of the key, the key would make a sound on the dish <laughs> that would wake him up and then he'd start to create. Oh, wow. Um and what it was really idea. interesting. Yeah, I'll I'll get it to you somehow. The study is fascinating, but they talk about um then they actually, this is, it was in the reference to this study where they actually, I don't think they were creatives, I forgot, but they did find that those people who were able to be woken, I think, right after sleeping had a much more prolific output than, let's say, people that were, you know, woken after four hours of sleep. So I guess right. the long way of asking you is, do you have those moments, you know, again, not when you wake up after eight hours, but maybe when you're just dozing off as a period of inspiration? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I can think of uh, some specific examples. The first one I come up with is not lyrical, but uh, but uh, I had a song. Uh, there's a song called Paper Tiger that's on Kill the Moonlight. And when I had been demoing it, it was sort of just like a strummed and then and then and then acoustic guitar thing. And it was it was just some good words, but it didn't really have any kind of direction. And as I was you know, as I was, uh, you know, laying back to take a nap one day, it all came to me how it should be um, processed. And it was all about this drum machine that had like a reverse. Da -da 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 -da. Da -da -da -da. There's the beat, you know, and I know that the keys should go. Bung, 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 bung. And it all just came and then I immediately got up and, and did it. And it wouldn't have happened. That song would not have become what it was had it not been for that uh those thoughts that happen pre-nap. But I always, I also found that like getting up in the morning first thing and doing it is good. Even though that is after eight hours, there's something about that, um, that frame of mind that um, before you're judging and before you're fully conscious that uh, things come out. Yeah, before you judge. And there was a uh, novel I read called Homeland Elegies. <laughs> The la guy's last name is Akhtar, and he won the Pulitzer Prize for another book like four years ago. I forgot the name of it, but the, the, the main character in the book is an author. And what he does is he ties a pencil to his finger so that if he wakes up in the middle of the night, he can yeah. write immediately and doesn't have to fumble for it in the dark. Yeah, um, but I love this idea, the Salvador Dali. I, I'm going to do that. I'll get it to you somehow. Yeah. Uh, but have it's you tried it? 
to, to do that? something? Have you tried to replicate that system? I I haven't, but yeah. I should because I just it it fascinated me when I wrote that. How yeah. because I know that I know exactly what they're talking about, right? You're yeah. in that space where you're not asleep, but all voices and sounds. Yeah. yeah. And they name this state. There's a state that the scientists name it, you know, right. what, what that is. Um, but uh, yeah. Idea. Yeah. Okay. So let's end with this because I know we don't have a couple more minutes, but, um, you know, again, Hemingway said all artists, all writers should go to art galleries to get inspired. Uh-huh. And I'm curious whether it's other artistic endeavors or how much reading do you get to do? Um, and how much of an impact does that have on your songwriting? Well, I love going to art museums. It did, it is inspiring. Is it really for you as a songwriter? It's inspiring. Yeah, it might. Well, you're, you're right. Maybe it is visual. I might come up with. Um, I mean, I definitely saw a a photo in an art museum that later we used as a as a record cover, a William Eggleston photo. But yeah, maybe it is uh, organizing and inspiring in a sort of more visual way. Uh, but do I read? Yeah, I read some. Uh, do, go ahead. Now I was gonna say, do you do you have favorite authors or genres that you like to read? Well, I really like nonfiction, but and I don't know that that's um, gonna inspire lyrics all the time. But that's where I tend to go a lot. Whether that's um, current events or, you know, uh, bio, like autobiographies. I, I like reading a lot. Um, every now and then I actually try to read poetry, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. I, I think there's plenty of nonfiction though. I mean, a good sentence, I don't care where it comes from. It can be inspiring, right? I mean, yeah. whether it's a combination of words that you've ne- never seen before. I mean, I, I keep on thinking about how, how I love the musicality of your new album title, how it's just, it's got great musicality. It's that lyric, that, that title is so euphonic. It's right. just, I can say it to myself. I know that's intentional, but, but, you know, you see a phrase like that in a book, it doesn't matter where it comes from. It can still be inspiring. Well, thanks. I mean, that's kind of how I felt about it. I just got this, this phrase that I wasn't sure where it came from. I later figured out what it meant, but, it is a, it does sound really nice. Even in your head, it sounds really nice. Yeah. Oh, it's great. Cipher Sofa. Cipher yeah. Sofa. That's what I keep on. It's beautiful. Um, well, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, I'll, I'll have to remind my uh, family members when they're uh, <laughs> down. Some of my family doesn't really get the title. They're very troubled by it. Uh, oh, I, I think it's, I, you, you say it to yourself, but yeah, it's, I mean, as someone who, who studies that stuff, it's the sounds, if the, it's those letters that just, they work so well together. That's what I'm going to point uh, out. Yeah. Yeah. See, there you go. <laughs> and that's it for the latest episode of songwriters on process. Don't forget. You can find all of my interviews with over 200 songwriters on my songwriters on process website at songwriters on process.com going all the way back to 2010. You can read them, watch them, or listen to them. So until next time, thanks for listening.